Howdy everyone, I'm Michael Perch and I record all of my lectures and put them online to support my students and working professionals. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin and I teach and work in data analytics, geostatistics, machine learning. Okay, so this week we have the midterm number two and it's because of the whole thing with remote learning and some of my students have challenged situations where they're not able to log in, they don't have good connectivity. I'm recording this video specifically. Hey, shout out to you guys, Longhorns. Stay strong, okay? We're gonna get through this thing. Okay, so I'm gonna record this as a tutorial that I'm gonna conduct in class in about an hour and a half from now, where I'm gonna do a walkthrough of my second midterm from last term. Okay, so I'll just grab my handy dandy Wacom tablet, move things around a little bit, got this here. Okay, so let's go ahead and work through this together. Now, I promise you it's gonna be much more interactive and interesting in class because I hope that people will be shouting out answers and chatting things, it'll be kind of super cool. But let's get started. This is the second midterm covering everything from about Veragram modeling through to machine learning. So spatial data analytics, modeling of spatial continuity in a positive definite manner, all the way up to machine learning. Now, the thing I should state is this year, because of some disruption, we are going to also include bivariate statistics. So there could be questions from those lectures on things like correlation coefficients and so forth. So just take a look at the uh, announcement, make sure you got that. We won't have any questions here on that. All right, so let's get right at this. Okay, so how would we define overfit? Now, first of all, I you know, whenever you answer these short questions, remember, I'm just looking for understanding. So if you made a statement around the fact that the, the error in test was larger or significantly larger than the error in train, and me, I, I apologize, I am very much a statistician from the perspective of I always look at things as uncertainty and variance to me as error. I could also use uh, a symbol representing error. That would be fine, just a big E or something like that would be fine too. Okay, the other thing too is it's always good to draw pictures. You could draw a picture where you were suggesting a simple model to a more complicated model. In other words, a model that can become more fit to the data in a simple model that's not. And then you could write mean squared error in test. And you could suggest that the model is getting better and then it comes back up and you could draw a line here and say anything from there is getting to be overfit. You could also comment on the fact that, so, so really what are we saying with overfit is we're reaching a point to which we're fitting and training to such a degree with a level of complexity that we're getting poor performance in testing. We're fooling ourselves and thinking we know more than we actually know. Now, you could also go to the Wikipedia type definitions, which say that you're starting to fit noise. I like that. Or idiosyncrasies, which I'm a terrible speller. I'll probably spell that wrong. Okay, zone one is tropy. So this is a question about Veragram uh, modeling. And so that was an important form or structure. And so you could draw a picture. That would be fine. Let's draw a picture of a Veragram. This is H lag distance. And this right here would be the uh, sill. We'd mark it as the variance. And we could indicate an experimental Veragram that does not reach the sill. You could also write that with words and say, you know, the Veragram um, experimental um, does not reach sill. Or we could say does reach a pseudo sill which is a lower sill. That was a term we also used in the class. Okay, so there's a whole variety of ways that we could describe that, but I think I think that would kind of capture kind of some of the main concepts. Um, I don't need you to go into details that maybe in the other direction you see a trend or cyclicity. If you wanted to, you could mention that, but there's kind of deeper things you could talk about there. Okay, Veragram weights, what do they calculate? account for. And you remember we set up a straw man where we said, well, you know, we have this Veragram, be nice to use that. So let's, we said, well, we want to account for the Veragram and the covariance. And we said that any type of method like inverse distance doesn't do that. 
and uniform weighting doesn't do that. None, none of those were good ideas, right? But we also said when we talked about inverse distance, we said, well, inverse distance accounts for closeness. Well, that's pretty cool, closeness because it seemed like that should matter. Proximity from the sample locations where we know to the unknown location would matter. And also redundancy. We said, well, uh, it doesn't account for redundancy. And that's a problem with the inverse distance method. And we said, oh, but look at this Kriegen system of equations, the Kriegen matrices, which show redundancy and closeness, you know, that would be really cool. And we thought that was really cool. So Veragram, our measure of spatial continuity, and that matters, it has directionality and so forth. You could write that. Um, closeness and redundancy. Okay, so what's deep learning? This one's super, super easy. Deep learning, remember, we said that that was a subset of machine learning. And specifically, we said it was the case of an artificial neural net where the number of hidden layers is what is going to be greater than one. That was it. That was, and we, you know, I, I often teach artificial neural nets. We didn't have time in this class. I think on Friday we'll, we'll dive into a bit. Add an extra layer, you can call it deep learning. And so there's a little bit of branding there, of course. Uh, and I don't want to diminish deep learning. I do have students who work with convolutional, um, deep, deep convolutional generative adversarial networks, and it's super, super cool stuff. Okay, so I'm not saying it's just simple. Okay, Kriging variance or estimation variance, we use those terms interchangeably in the class. Uh, re really, an estimation variance was that general form of this idea of a the expectation of the square difference between the estimate minus the truth, and that was squared. Okay, so that was, now you could get, of course, anytime we do spatial, you could put a location vector there, and you could put the alpha to indicate indices, and that we're taking the expectation over multiple locations. It's, it's fine to just put expectation of the estimate minus the, um, minus the truth, squirt okay now you could also give the actual so that's the estimation variance but you could give the kriging variance which is a special case in the kriging system and of course that was equal to the kriging variance is equal to the now we often say covariance at zero distance you could also just say the variance i'd give you 100 percent for that minus the sum of the weights i equals one through oh one through n neighboring data and this would be multiplied by the covariance between the locations I and location, the unknown location, where that it, we're making the estimate at that location. That would be fine. Now, you could also get kind of have some fun with this and say, well, hey, Dr. Perch told us Kriegen's our new friend because it's honest. It tells us the very best estimate and it tells us how bad, <laughs> how bad the estimate is. Now I'm having a little too much fun. You could have you could have also said it's a measure of the goodness of the estimate. And that would be probably a better way to communicate. I'm just in a cheerful mood today. Okay, multiple point statistics. Let's just move that up. Easier for me to work on my pad. Okay, multiple point statistics. This was the idea of remember a varigram is really a two point spatial step. Okay. And what we suggested that multiple point simulation was a simulation approach and in fact was sequential, just like Gaussian. So we could even put that. It's a sequential simulation with a spatial measure where the number of points is greater than two. But now we can't calculate it from the data. So we use a training image. Okay, we use some type of training image to capture. And you could talk about a multiple, multiple, excuse my writing, multiple point statistic or template. 
And we even drew that. And if you drew one of those, that would be kind of epic. That'd be awesome. You can imagine any multiple point template with the unknown location in the middle. And these are the lags, which is interesting. With Veragram, we had two points, so we had one lag. Here we're going to have technically n minus one lags because we got that one point in the middle, the unknown location. And we'll scan that template, that multiple point template through the training image. Super cool. Really revolutionary in subsurface models. Like really. And a shout out to Dr. Sebastian Strabel who made that approach practical through really great computational methods like search trees which really revolutionized self subsurface modeling. And you could capture, you can even put that, you can capture nonlinear features, ordering relationships. I believe that was in the notes too. Okay, ordinary versus simple Kriegen. How would I compare and contrast them? So the big difference between them is that simple Kriegen, okay, I should just put SK. I should speed up here. SK is going to have as an input the global mean, and it better be a representative, right? We got to correct for it, global mean. And it's going to away or outside the range, it's going to go to the mean. Now, of course, you could have done some type of trend modeling, you know, trend and residual, and in which case the global mean will be zero residual. And that's pretty common to do. If you do a trend residual workflow, use simple Kriegen. The other point I'll make, and this is a softer point, kind of, but important, is for the whole sequential Gaussian simulation approach. It really does assume simple Kriegen. Because then the variances are all right. And, you know, maybe, maybe that's too much detail. Okay, ordinary Kriegen. It doesn't, you don't input the global mean. It will estimate and use the local mean. So outside the range of correlation, it will use an estimated local mean. Now, you could also draw, and that would be like really epic if you wanted to. You could draw the covariance matrix, the, co the covariance matrices, the left-hand and right-hand side for the Kriegen system of equations, and you could put in one through n weights and this is the covariance between the unknown location the covariance between the unknown location and data point n and then you could indicate that the addition of a bunch of ones here a zero here ones here and a the lagrange parameter would be added in right here and so now we have a constraint of the sum of the weights equal to one so that would be important probably want to put that in too sum of the weights i equals one through n are going to be equal to one and remember if you you could also go back and you could show this the original simple Kriegen estimator is equal to the sum of the weights multiplied by the data i's i's i through one through n and then what we did is to an unbiasedness constraint where we said and we'll add in one minus the sum of the weights I, I equals one through N. And we'll multiply that by the global mean. And that by using the sum of the weights equals to one, we force this to go to zero. Ordinary Kriegen does not need the global mean. It's gonna estimate it locally. Super cool, that's really, really, really cool. Okay, so that can be pretty useful too. Okay, now let's go to the next question. Compare and contrast inference and prediction. Okay, the, uh, the way I like to do this is I just like to draw population, sample. Okay, and if you're using an assumption about the population, about what the system is, to make a prediction of the next sample, then this would be right here. I don't know if that right there would be a prediction, okay? If you're going from the sample and trying to say something about the population, that's gonna be an inference, okay? Now, an example of both, I'm cool, coin flips or exploration wells, you can use that, it's right from the cor uh, course content. So you could say, given fair coin, how many heads? I, I like that example. It keeps in your head. How many heads? 
in n tosses. Okay, and if you come up with a probability model for that, that's a prediction. You're predicting the next sample, assuming something about the population. Inference would be given um, n h heads of n tosses tell me the probability of h heads. Okay, that would be an inference. That's given the sample, tell me something about what the system is, the population is. Okay, now describe three criteria of big data. Oh, we love big data. Do I have big data? I think I have big data. And in fact, in many subsurface data sets, we do have big data. Okay, so volume. Let me just write some down. A variety. Okay. Um, variability. Veracity. And velocity. Okay. I think those, I'm, I hope I got them all. I hope I get 100% on this test. <laughs> okay, so volume, it's just the hard to, hard to work with. Hard to work with, and I'm thinking about load, and try to store, and visualize, you know, all of that. Variety. Okay, you have many different features. M is kind of large. You have a lot of M's. There's a lot of different things you can work with. Um, you know, on different scales and so forth, right? Uh, variability. The acquisition changes over time. You could have a feature that, um, like a seismic inverted property, that is very different between um, 2D, 3D, 4D, and so forth, or high resolution reprocessing and so forth. So that changes over time. Acquisition changes over time. Okay. The veracity. There is uncertainty in the data. Jeez, I'm gonna, I should get extra marks for this. Okay. And velocity. And the collection rate is fast relative to the cycle time. Now, remember, our tech friends often will talk about real-time data. It's just all the time. I would always say that we have high velocity because of the fact that we have high rates of collection relative to the complexity of our workflows. Okay, this is the fun part, Veragram modeling. Now remember, this could happen. We could have a Veragram model on the midterm. Okay, so now what do I do? I want to note the important contributions that I'm gonna need to cope with. So let me first note that there's a nugget effect at 0 0.4 that I really need to capture. And at 0 0.6, I've got, what's it called? Zonal anisotropy. So I know my t structures, contributions are going to be 0 0.4, 0 0.2 to get me to that zonal anisotropy right up here, and then another 0 0.4 here. So I see three different structures I have to capture. Okay, the horizontal direction. In the horizontal direction, what I see is 0.4 is going to be 0. It's effectively nugget effect. Now you might say, why don't you use nugget effect, Michael? It's because we don't have nugget effect in all directions. So I can't call it nugget effect. Nugget effect is isotropic. We'll have an apparent nugget effect by using a range of zero in this direction. Now I could note about 600 meter range. So I, and remember the structures don't have an inflection point here. I don't see an inflection point really. So I'm comfortable to model it all as two structures with the same range. It'll look like one structure with that range and the contribution summed. So 600, 600. And that gets me up here. Good. Horizontal minor wall. I've got what looks like a single structure. And let's just say for sake of argument around 400. You don't have to be precise here. Okay. So 400, and it looks like one structure. So I'm good to go 400, 400, and guess it, 400. Okay. And now the vertical direction. Now, it looks to me maybe around 12, 13. I'll put 13, my favorite number. Okay, 13 up to 0.6, and it looks like a single structure. So 13, 13. Now we need zonal anisotropy. To get that, use a very large number. Okay, so computationally, 9, 9, 9. Put an extra 9 in. It'll flatten out the contribution. You have to have all structures in all directions, but by putting the range very large in the vertical direction, we cause it not to be effective in that direction, and we're still positive definite. Okay, what do you think of the shape of the structure? Well, it's definitely not Gaussian. 
It looks linear at first. It doesn't ramp up and, and it does reach the sill pretty sharply. I don't see asymptotic approach of the sill, so I don't think it's exponential. I'm going to call it, I'm going to say they're all spherical. Okay, spherical. Okay, good. I'm pretty proud of my varigram. I just modeled a varigram. Okay, that's a three-dimensional positive definite model because we're using uh, a nesting or a contribution or combination or addition of multiple positive definite spherical structures. And they're all effective over all directions. And each of them have a constant contribution for each structure, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, and 0.4 again. Okay, let's compare and contrast local accuracy of Kriging and global accuracy of simulation. This is a very good question and very important because two modes of spatial, you know, prediction are estimation and simulation. Okay, so let's compare and contrast. Estimation versus simulation. Estimation, well, blue, best linear unbiased estimator is what we say about Kriging. So it gets the best estimate at each location. Okay, now what I should say too is it's really focused on getting, it's focused on the job of one estimate. It wants really one estimate. The fact that we put a bunch of estimates at all locations into a map and visualize them is not what Kriging's trying to do. Its job is to get the very best estimate. Let's go ahead and say, well, what will that do? Well, first of all, the variance is going to be too low. The varigram is going to be wrong. What, what I would say is it's going to be too smooth. Okay, too smooth. It's fine at the data locations. Remember, the smoothing effect of Kriging is the Kriging variance. So at locations far away from the data outside of range, it's completely too smooth. At the data locations where you've got zero Kriging variance, it's okay. It's okay. Of course it's okay. It's the data. Okay, now assimilation. It gets a good estimate at, and, and I apologize for using the word estimate, but let's just change that and put good value. I don't want to cause people to say, well, simulation uses estimates. That's kind of weird. So it's a good value at each location. Okay, good. The, the one thing that's really cool is it sacrifices local accuracy for global accuracy, and that's in the question, so we don't have to say that, but what that means is that the variance is correct, and the varigram is correct, and it provides a measure of uncertainty globally by multiple realizations. Man, I don't even fit my space, okay? Whereas Kriging does provide you a local uncertainty, but not a joint global uncertainty. It provides local uncertainty. All right, I hope that's somewhat readable. All right, how does simulation correct for the missing variance? So the best way to write that out would be the simulated value, Y being that we have removed the trend and we're working with a residual that has zero mean. Um, will be equal to the y estimate plus a random residual. And we'll put location vectors just for good. We should be doing that more often. Location u at a location u alpha. Okay, so location within our model. Okay, so it's going to add in the missing variance right here. And I think the best way to do that is we should actually do it like this. U, and that should be a bold. And we'll say distributed as Gaussian distribution, because this is sequential Gaussian methodology, right? Gaussian distribution with zero mean and the Kriegen variance is the missing variance that we're adding in. And if you said that, you, you nailed it. That's exactly what it does. Now, we showed the proof in class that that does not wreck the covariance which is super cool between the data and doesn't wreck the covariance between the simulated values after we add in the residual, um, given the fact that we work sequentially because the simulated values all become data. Oops, I think I actually just answered the next question. I got too excited. How does simulation ensure I did, uh, ensure the covariance between the simulated values um, is correct? Okay, so how is it gonna do that? So what simulation is going to do is it's going to work sequentially. 
Okay, so the sequential approach. Oh, sequential. Sorry about that. Sequential approach. Okay. With the sequential approach, what we're going to do is we're going to treat simulated values as data for subsequent, okay, subsequent um, simulation locations on the random path. Okay, that's fine. If you if you got that, that's pretty cool. And we prove that because we pr we know we prove that the covariance is correct between the data and the simulated values. So we kind of, it's funny, it's kind of almost like a math trick. We say, well, just make the data as correlated values. Now, if you think about it, it's kind of really cool, and I can't help myself, that if I have data, 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 and I have multiple values I'm simulating at, if I simulate a low value here, now when I go over here, this is point number one, point number two, it's going to impose a covariance, and this distribution from the Kriging will now be shifted lower and narrower and the Monte Carlo simulation will be constrained to get a probably low value. So it actually makes a lot of sense because if we didn't do that, if we didn't work sequentially, that distribution would, that we're drawing from of Monte Carlo would be, remain quite wide and we could get a high value right beside a low value. So this sequential approach actually makes a lot of good sense. It's really cool. Okay. How does simulation calculate multiple realizations? Okay, so the whole idea is that you use a seed and you could comment on pseudo random numbers and so forth, but a seed goes in and what the seed impacts is A, the random path. And in fact, if you go into GS Live, the geostatistical library, it just assigns a random number to every node location that you're gonna simulate and does a sort. And if you think about it, that's super simple. It gives you a nice random path. Now. We do exclude data locations. We don't simulate at the data locations, right? Okay. A random path, so through the data. And if you think about it, if I take um, some, of, some of the students in class were kind of amazed by that because that'll change the model. If I start kind of at a certain location, I'll be influenced by certain data that will impose more correlation around there. And then I'd Monte Carlo simulate high. Whoa, now I've got a high there and that high will grow out based on the random path. And so it's kind of cool. The other thing is that all of those Monte Carlo simulations of the RU alphas at the simulation locations, those Monte Carlo simulations are random drawings between zero and one. And then we're basically just applying the inverse of the Gaussian distribution, right? The Gaussian distribution for zero, and, well, I should put normally distributed zero creating variance. Okay. And we're going to draw with the specific P value from Monte Carlo right there. That's how we do, Monte Carlo is just going to be drawing with that P value, which is a random value that's uniformly. Dish. Anyway, I don't need to keep going. I'm just having too much fun. That would be good enough right there. List and to explain two elements of the curse of dimensionality. Remember this? Horror stories with Professor Perch. Okay, so the first one that I like to talk about is coverage. Coverage was this idea of the fact that we're going to um, never, you really don't capture the entire range. And so if I drew a uh, two-dimensional problem, and I could imagine drawing the marginal distribution, the marginal distribution, feature one, feature two. Well, I would say you're kind of lucky if you get coverage of 80% of the range. So let's give ourselves 80% coverage in feature one, 80% coverage in feature two, or no, no, vice versa. That's fine. Okay. Now, if I look at the bivariate relationship, this is the predictor feature space. How much of it am I covering? This is now 64%. In fact, the 1D coverage raised to the power of dimensionality is the actual M and D coverage. Okay, now you could denote it like that, that's fine. And so for two dimension, three dimension, you can see as it goes up, 
in dimensionality, you have much worse coverage. In fact, if you think about it, what's interesting is there's the interesting phenomenon where as part of this, that as we go to very high dimensional spaces, the majority of the space becomes corners or edges. Ah, kind of crazy stuff. Anyway, you don't have to get into that. The other thing I like is sampling. And that was the idea that if you, once again, if you're trying to get, understand a phenomenon, you got feature one, feature two. Well, if you bend up the, the distribution, that's estimating a histogram. And clearly, you know, if we have more data, we can make more bins. And so what we know is that normally the estimation of a histogram is the estimation of a frequency or in standardized histogram is an estimate of a probability of being in a bin requires multiple samples. And so we could say if there's uh, five bins, we're going to need some data in each bin. And so we could say we need 10 data normally in each bin. Now I understand that out here we have much less likelihood of having data. And so it's not uniform. It doesn't, of course, it doesn't have to be uniform. It's not uniform distribution, but normally how many data do I need per bin? Okay, and so if I say there's five bins, I'll need 50 data in one dimension. But as soon as I go, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three. Let me see if I fit one down there. Now, how many bins do I have? Well, I actually have number of bins raised to the power of m and multiplied by that by the number of data needed normally per bin. So whereas before I said I needed 50 data in two dimensions, I now have 25 bins, 10 data per bin normally, I need about 250 data and so forth and so on. You can see that will grow very quickly. And for a 10 dimensional problem, you're in a situation where you probably really won't have enough data. Unless you, it, it would be such a large number, depending of course on number of bins and so forth. Okay, so that's two, that's sampling of the joint probabilities to understand the phenomenon. Okay, the other one is that you could say more likely you have multicollinearity. Okay, that's more likely that you have features that in fact are linear combinations of each other. In other words, you have less information than you think you do, and the result is model instability. Okay, that could be another problem. And I missed another one, visualization. It's just hard to visualize high dimensional features. Okay, I think I covered that. I think I'll, I think I'll get full marks for that. Okay, now this one right here, I love this. I love this, this is so much fun. And so you didn't have to memorize this equation exactly. You know, you could have talked about the idea that it is the expected, oh, I'm gonna do it anyway, between the data, i's, they like to use the i's, and then you have your f hat with all your x i, do, 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 x, uh, x1 I mean through x m i i. This is all of the data that you're available for predictions. And so it's the expectation of the, uh, let's see, square. And then I miss a bracket, I missed a bracket. Sorry about that. Okay, you know what I mean. So the expectation of, and you know what I should have done? I should have, I could have done, I could say I equals one through, you know, N testing data. If you say that, that's fine. You, you denote that this idea that this is the expectation over the testing data that you have available to you. Now, this would be the mean squared error in testing. And you don't have to memorize the equation, but the components include model variance, model bias, and good old fashioned, inescapable, irreducible error. Okay. It's a bowl error. Okay, good. Okay, so let's just describe those really quickly. And what can we say about them? Well, first of all, model variance is the sensitivity to the actual data that you're working with, the, the training data. Okay. Okay. So now what we can say, model variance is the sensitivity to the actual data that you have available. And what it comes down to is the fact that, well, if I use just a slightly different data set, 
how would my model change? Would it change erratically? And I like to think about a linear model is very simple. You change the data, slope change a little bit, the intercept to change a little bit. A ninth order polynomial fit, you change the data and that whole thing can just swing around so much, it can be very, very unstable for you. Okay, so what we know is we draw this from a simple model to a complicated model that the mean squared error in testing well, so far we said with model variance, we said that for a simple model, low model variance, and then going up. So model variance. Okay. Now model bias is kind of the opposite. It's interesting. It's a balance. That's why we call it the model bias variance trade-off. Model bias is the fact that our model's not flexible enough. It's not flexible enough to model the natural system for the natural system, which the actual F the natural system we're trying to model okay i hope you would write a little more completely i'm trying to be a little quick about this to make this not a boring video i'm sure you probably sped me up already and that's probably sounding very high pitched which would be fine okay so irreducible error this is the problem due to just data it's a data limit it's you don't have coverage you don't have sampling of all the possible combinations you can't observe all of the interactions you in fact may be missing some critical features you just don't have those features which are essential okay so this is independent of the model in fact what i like to say is if the world's most famous machine learning modelers were coming here working with your data they cannot improve that okay so this irreducible error is constant this model bias is going to go down as you get more oops 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 oh what did i do oh, shucks i think i double clicked or something okay okay all right this model bias is going to drop a more complicated model can fit the phenomenon better and they're additive in fact we know that these are, we can sum these all together to get that. And so we would expect that the ultimate curve would look something like, I hope it looks something like that. And there'd be some optimal level of complexity. And so this would be your error, your mean squared error in testing right here. Okay, okay. Now, I should note something. So anybody watching this who's about to take my midterm on Wednesday, don't worry. Don't worry. Um, this question would not be in scope because of some missed class time. We did not cover FACES modeling. But for those of you for who want to hear the answer to this, well, of course. Okay, listen and explain two criteria for selection. The first one is that oh, for selection of FACES and reservoir modeling. Sorry, I kind of skipped over that. The first one is it should separate... Oh, separate, I spelled that wrong. Separate the petrophysical properties. And so let me just Z one through, oh, you know, you know what I'm doing Zs because, or Zs, sorry, the um, geostats like to use, likes to use Zs. Machine learning is more Xs, it's okay, it's okay. You wanna separate these distributions. Now, the way I like to draw it is, could you imagine porosity, permeability? And if I had a bunch of data, I would want the two faces to, in fact, separate because if they're completely the same, that's not very useful. Okay, that's the first one. The second one, they need to be mappable. Away from data, in space. What that means is you can't use faces that I can't predict away from measured locations. Otherwise, I'd be in a situation where it's not helping me make a spatial prediction. I don't want to use it. Okay, it needs to help me. Now remember, these are criteria. You have to work with all of them, right? The other thing, it must be something you can see in the common data. Um, what that means is you can't use spaces from core, well core, if you have cores only at limited locations, but you have logs everywhere at all well bores, then it has to be identifiable in the well bores. Okay, otherwise... You can't use it because you can't see it at the data locations. You can't constrain it in the model. So seeing the common data, the most 
calm. Now, that doesn't mean it's seen in seismic necessarily directly. I get that. I'm not saying the because seismic can often be exhaustive, but at a much larger scale. No, I mean, when it comes to that most common data and for well data, it's cores and well logs and you have to be able to see it in the well logs, which are more common. Now, if you happen to be in a subsurface setting where you have core everywhere, by all means, use facies based on core. As long as it's mappable, se separates out the petrophysical properties and number four, the inference problem. What that means is you need enough continuous petrophysical property within uh, samples within each one of the facies. So you can infer the distributions, the verigrams. Yeah. Uh, what did I use? Z, I of Z, I. The just cumulative. Oh, I drew it as a, sorry. That's a lowercase for the PDF or uppercase for the CDF. Okay. Need to be able to know the distributions and the verigram for each. All right. So that was writing my midterm and there it is i'll put it back in the location all right and that's we're done we're done we succeeded and i think we wrote that pretty quickly i was chatty i talked a lot so i probably slowed it down i hope now please don't write as messy as i do i was trying to talk and write at the same time and i'm really bad at writing i really am kind of messy overall please try to make it legible and you know, feel free to embellish a little bit or add a little bit. Always demonstrate your knowledge. In this class, we definitely reward you for demonstrating your knowledge. It's not a case of, it's not a case of if you kind of reach out and try to show your knowledge and you get one minor point wrong that we're going to penalize you beyond somebody who didn't go as deeply as you. We, we try to be very fair. It's more like we're trying to see to what level you understand. And if you reach that level, you're good. Um, the other thing too is I think I included a bonus question on this one, kind of a fun one. So I hope that cheers people up. Okay. Once again, I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin and I record all of my lectures. Why do I do it? Because to support my students with evergreen content that can go even beyond the course, because what do I always say? You take my classes, we're now family. And you know, what's really cool? Go ahead, reach out. The door was open during the class. The door remains open after the class. And it joys my heart when I hear good stories about my former students doing great and having a great career. And I also don't mind answering some questions. Kind of cool. Okay, so everybody take care and stay safe. All right, see ya. Bye.